Hey, this is Phil Better from the podcast Invest in Yourself, the Digital Entrepreneurs Podcast. Have you ever wanted to be an entrepreneur? Have you heard about all those kids making money on the internet? Do you want to start making money on the internet? Go to investinyourselfpod.com, subscribe, and listen as I interview people who have actually made money online. Listen to me, create a business, and see if I can succeed. Catch new episodes every Tuesday at investinyourselfpod.com. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Historia Canadiana, the show about Canadian culture and the way it informs this nation's history. My name is Patrick, and with me, as always, is the treasure map to my heart, Mackenzie. Oh, you're such a sweetie. Look at you buttering me up. Am I a lobster? Yes, absolutely. You're going to be some... Whatever, I'm not going to go into this joke. (laughs) Look at you buttering my biscuit. (laughs) Look, I might as well make especially the harder episodes, I might as well start them off fun because if we're just going to get depressed for the rest of it, why not? (laughs) Obviously, before we start the show, just a quick reminder that if you want to support us, you can check out the Patreon and all other goodies in the description below. We'll talk more about that at the end of the show. Also, if you want to follow along with the texts that we're referring to or reading directly from today, They're also linked in the description, including the main book today, which is all available for free and legally online. So before we get started today, I want to start with a listener question, which relates directly to our topic. And so this came about a month ago from a listener called Via. Um, And her question was, among many others, When and how did cultural differences start to develop between Eastern and Western Canada, right? Western being the prairie provinces, BC and so on, and Eastern Canada being what we've mostly been talking about on this show so far, Quebec, Ontario, the Maritimes. And is the rift rift widening or narrowing? Well, Via, today, if you're listening, we're going to start answering that question in a sense. Because what we're going to do is start talking about British Columbia and a group of First Nations that lives there and its first contact with European settlers, namely in this case, James Cook and the British. So what this is going to set up is not only the contact between two different types of populations than had been previously established in the East, but also start to immediately see certain while initial, at least certain patterns that are similar, they're going to pretty rapidly diverge, right? And we're going to see why, obviously, as the show goes on. But I wanted to mention that question first and foremost to kind of set the scene. So, Mac, I guess because we were talking about this at uh, in the fir- before the we started recording, you're a bit more aware of like travel literature and stuff like that, right? You have yeah. like, an awareness of it. Yeah, yeah just. Based around my background, where I grew up, there was our curriculum afforded a bit more time to discussions of travel, European travel, and they're sort of moving through everything within uh, Canada and around it and how they sort of explored what led to exploration, that sort of stuff. Right. Um, I guess, simple question to, to, to start us off with. Would you consider travel literature just literature, like we're talking about here, colonial literature about traveling uh, or written by travelers? Or would you consider it just any book that relates to travel and relates to uh, people who are traveling, right? Even if it's not necessarily the traveler writing him, uh, him or herself, right? Do you make hey, well, a distinction? Or? There's a bit of debate, actually, in that sort of where you, what you start classifying as travel literature, what is not. Because some people, they do travel literature and they use it more as a catalog of what they've seen and then like very specific, scientific, what they're writing down. But then a lot of the major uh, literature that we use in regards to travel literature and what we've used to sort of understand history is very narratively focused and narratively driven, you know? Right. So like the big example being John Smith, who... And the event, and with his meeting of Pocahontas and the First Nations people around there, around Jamestown, yep. and how that is very, very, very structured in a way to set up a romantic narrative and all these other things. Okay. But now we have been able to look at it later on. We have been able to turn back and see that was not the case. So 
a lot of time we associate travel literature with the narratively driven, but there's also like people who are just writing about their travels in journals or people who are making catalogs also counts. Right. Okay. It's all travel literature. It's a very broad definition, right? And it can kind of sure. encompass a lot of stuff. The reason I'm, I'm bringing this up is because we're going to be looking in a sense at two bodies of literature this week. So on the one end, and that's going to mostly encompass the historical section of the show, is going to be exactly what you were describing. More travel literature, travel narratives, if you want to cover mm -hmm. it a bit more broadly. Um, namely by James Cook arriving in uh, near BC and his men and all of the stuff that accompanies it. And we're going to be talking about the perceptions that these initial settlers uh, perpetuated and had, legitimately had, of mm -hmm. the native populations around them. And then in the second part of the show, we're going to cover a bit of a different type of literature. It's poetry, and I guess could broadly be construed as travel literature, mm -hmm. insofar as it's talking about the travels of James Cook, right? Specifically, it's a book called Convergences, and yeah. it sets up specifically that, the first contact of James Cook based off of his writings, with the uh with the native american version of it the specifically the moa chat people that he meets based off of their oral traditions right yeah and we can definitely well there's a lot that we can talk about just from there in the oral tradition versus the written word oh yeah. and then also what we count as travel literature due to the fact that most of the time our travel literature is considered things that were like accounts by people first-hand accounts things that we use to study to understand from people's travels and we understand other places that we can get to. Definitely. Where Convergences fixes into that as it's almost like it's its own account of an account. Yeah, in a sense, definitely. And, you know, you, you hit really on the head on that one because what I wanted to approach with this episode and one of the reasons I was mentioning also before we started recording why I started the show in the first place is how literature in general and specifically what Lionel Kearns is trying to do with convergences is kind of question what it means to write history and how it literally in this case converges with uh, literary writing or what we'd consider right. more literary writing. Right. Yeah. Portrayals of history is always going to be a hot topic. Oh yeah. Um, but I think he approaches it in a really interesting way that I wanted to uh, get into here, right? Even though it's a later book. Mm-hmm. Um, but all that is going to be explored throughout the episode. Before we get started into James Cook as a person and his writing, did you have anything that you wanted to add, or can we get right into it? I think we can get right into it. Let, yeah. I'll add as we go. Yeah, sure. So, classic question. What do you know about James Cook? I knew a bit more of him, actually. Again, just based around the fact of knowing a bit more about travelers and exploration. James Cook was, I still had to look him up to re-familiarize myself, but he was a name that I was more familiar with, a name that I'd heard a bit more mm -hmm. as we go through. Big cartographer. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> Which definitely. Is an interesting thing to have for such an important figure, just because you think of travel literature and the figures in it, and it comes off, again, the stereotypical one, the boy John Smith. Mm -hmm. muscular heroic etc cetera, etc cetera. he's oh, yeah. the, he's usually again they're all leaders of their voyages or expeditions but they all more what is construed as the masculine traits of the time so cook makes it a very interesting contrast figure the dude makes maps that's his biggest most important feature and it definitely gives brings a different eye to everything you read about his travels oh yeah and again he just kind of extrapolating off of this idea of the maps that you're bringing up, Cook is kind of seen differently than other explorers insofar as he's seen as an example of this enlightenment figure. He's not mm -hmm. seen as an example of a conqueror, although he most certainly does embody that in many ways. Oh, yeah. The rhetoric around him from a very early age, uh, from a very early uh, writings about him, like it's been decades that it's been like this, is that he's more scientifically minded and less conquest minded or imperial minded. The thing is, often these two came hand in hand, 
right? <laughs> Especially well, yeah, I mean, as the Enlightenment progressed. Um, like the, the only idea. reason these people would be able to do these things and that he has all this time is that they would get grants from the monarch, the government, because it was all a race. It was all a race to figure out the Northwest Passage, to figure out how to get from one end to a spot to another the fastest way. Oh, yeah. And it was couched in an idea, an excuse, if you will, of saying like, well, it's for scientific knowledge. And to some extent, it did it did advance certain scientific knowledges. Oh, for sure. I believe individual people definitely had the gain, the goal of gaining science and yes. were scientifically minded. But again, you're studying exploration. You got to remember that for the most part, it's fueled by the three G's. Go Gold, glory, and God. There you go. You're calling ah. it as it is. But you're right. Yeah, it's exactly that. As you say, he's best known for map making and specifically he's the first to have circumnavigated New Zealand and the east coast of Australia, right? So he's known for actually mapping that whole area, coming into contact Ooh. with the aboriginal population of Australia, or at least being mm -hmm. the first European to come into contact with the aboriginal population of Australia. And he's very well known as like a founding settler of that area, right? right. In the same way as you'll see a lot of uh, discussion here in, or at least here in Quebec, of Samuel de Champlain and that kind of uh, figure. Oh, he's Champlain. a bit, of, he's a bit of that for Australia, right? <laughs> but you know what I mean, right? There's like these yeah, central yeah. settler figures that kind of kickstart it all. No, for uh, sure. That's just, oh Samuel, oh Samuel. I did one episode on it, and it was one episode too much. <laughs> like, as it pertains to Canada, though, Cook actually came here twice. Right. Okay. So initially, he actually joined the British Navy in 1755. So we're dialing back the clock a bit from where we're, uh, where the rest of our show is at on the East Coast. Right. But he joined the British Navy in 1755. And contrary to most people who joined the British Navy, he came from a relatively humble background. He came from a mining family. And he, he legitimately worked his way up in a way that a lot of people couldn't. Right. Or at least didn't have the opportunity to. Mm -hmm. And right around the time where he would get his big break is when the British had taken over from the French in North America. Right? So when it went from officially being New France to the province of Quebec under the British, that's more or less where um, Cook would arrive in the waters of the St. Lawrence. And he was tasked with surveying that area. Right? Mm -hmm. And in that period, right, so in the 1760s and later part of, uh, during that whole decade, he's best known for having mapped the coastline of Newfoundland, which seems like an odd thing to say, considering that Newfoundland was England's first colony dating back to the 16th century. Right? Mm -hmm. But it was a very... It was known as being like a particularly difficult coastline. It's very foggy up there. It's very rocky. And so that's actually a pretty amazing feat to have done that. And it and, kind of shows his capabilities as a navigator. And the fact that like you take a look at what he cartographed of Newfoundland, it's basically what we use today. It's still, you look at the chart of Newfoundland that James Cook makes, it's it's still pretty pretty central to what we have for the charts of Newfoundland. Oh yeah, which is impressive in of itself. Definitely, because if you look at some of those early maps of the 16th, 17th, 18th century, some of them are rough. Like you you wonder <gasps> how how they actually did it. <laughs> oh, you you understand how many why so many explorers got lost. Oh yeah, so much. It's intense. <laughs> when I was doing earlier episodes on New France. I was looking up some of those old maps. Man, I don't know what parts of Quebec they were going after, but Jesus, it doesn't look like anything I ever saw. <laughs> <laughs> that period of James, Cook life, uh, James Cook's life in those early North American days isn't what really got him fame and success. He was well recognized for what he did, but it's mm -hmm. really with his second and third voyages that he would gain much more prominence. Right? because he would be tasked with exploring basically the South Pacific, right? And this is where these explorations of Australia, New Zealand, eventually what would be known as Hawaii, um, all those places throughout the early 1770s would be mapped and explored by Cook, right? Being mm -hmm. the first British person to do that, 
And so there's definitely some knowledge that he's adding to the British base. And that's really what puts him at the forefront of the British imperial mind as this person who's able to go everywhere and really get results as to what the British wanted in terms of imperialism, scientific knowledge, resources, you name it, Cook's the man. What we specifically want to talk about today is his third and final voyage, right? Because as all good voyages begin when they relate to Canada, the British task Cook with finding the mythical and still elusive Northwest Passage. Elusive because it's not existent. Right. Unless you just plow through a bunch of ice in the north. But an, a consistent passage does not exist indeed. Cook probably had the best idea of how to deal with finding it where he went from the other side for once. Unlike everybody else. <laughs> everybody else. Everybody else was lazy. They wanted to go like just through the top and they figured they could come through the back. Cook had the brains to be like, okay, wait, 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 wait. Let's go from the other side this time. Let's see if there's actually something to be found here. Yeah, but it's, it's also, yeah. And also this is before, uh, this is just before uh, Alexander Mackenzie would make his famous voyage across North America, right? In 1788, mm. 1789, like he would cross Canada again in search of that Northwest Passage. So like 10 years later, which... I guess gives you an indication as to the success of Cook's mission, but <laughs> like there was still this idea that it was very possible, but you're right. I love it. We've been approaching this problem from this one side constantly and everybody keeps dying. Let's try the other direction. Just, just for the fun of it. Like what's the worst that can happen, right? And then lo and behold, they realize the truth. There's no way around. Nope. It's just a big snowy block forever and miles and miles until global warming hits we'll get there eventually what <laughs> upside from global warming the <laughs> northwest passage is confirmed getting back onto topic uh, the british task cook with finding the northwest passage in 1776 cook as you say would go around the other side so he goes down new zealand he goes up hawaii and mm -hmm. he would end up in 1778 at the area where we're going to talk about today and that is near Vancouver Island. And he would eventually accost on Vancouver Island, specifically in a place called Nootka Sound. Right? This little cove that is named Nootka, but that he misconstrues also the name of its population as the Nootkas, which they're not called. But mm -hmm. that's, we'll get to that eventually, the idea of naming. His ship is a bit broken down and he decides to stop there. And his... Narrative, I guess, and the way he describes it is really what's going to form not only the initial basis of his journals during this, this time, but will obviously become influential for how Lionel Kearns is going to describe it much later. Mm -hmm. Cook is already proving how different he is. Like, I, I can't stress enough the thought process of going from the other side, going at the problem from a different direction, really shows how much he stands out. Mm -hmm. amongst his peers how much how much more of an enlightened thinker he was giving credence to this idea of enlightenment but he was also like i didn't mention this yes you're right but also it's not like the spanish hadn't already gone there by the way we i didn't mention this but the spanish had laid claim to nutka sound before mm -hmm. like oh, yeah, they, yeah. They, they were aware of its existence right people had gone there or at least there, there were obviously people there but europeans had gone there before Oh, you yeah, know, when, when, uh, but, whenever we say discovery, they really weren't discovering anything. No, no, this no, no, place no. was inhabited first and foremost. And then like dozens of other explorers had come and gone by the time that they got there. Yeah. But, but as um, for, for a British explorer, yeah, he certainly had a different train of thought. Ex uh, exactly. Right. And thinking of just keep going north. Right. I don't think anyone had gone that uh, had kept going north that much, uh, as much as he had, or at least I don't think any explorer had gone that far north up mm. to that point. Cook was thinking, okay, so Columbus proved we can go around the world like that. Can we go over the top? <laughs> <laughs> then come back down? Really, really exploring the space of spheres. Spheres. <laughs> that's some spherical thinking right there. Uh, we might bring up space again, because that's another theme that Kearns brings up. Yeah, it's always just important to talk space in regards to exploration, especially around the, the Pacific. And again, Cook and his cartography is really fascinating. 
and you, it's kind of incredible that he managed to do it. Oh yeah. When like, because you have the Maori Maui people who live in that area, and then generations ago they would like they had pathfinders for this to figure this out. You know, these they were people that had spent years studying how to read ocean current shifts in the wind and all that just to get around and they what they did was even more incredible because they did all of that without a map which i think yeah. leads back to why so much of this area was so uncharted it was because first nations people didn't have the concept of mapping yeah they didn't need it well yeah because they didn't try and own the property yeah exactly they didn't try that's to what conquer map, the world <laughs> that's what maps do yes okay maps are just a function of so you can lay out who owns what. Definitely, right? It's a it's a method of ownership. It's a method of border making. It causes, in my opinion, more problems than anything else. Oh yeah, <laughs> more not not anything else, but as a map, it causes more problems than it solves. But whatever. The reason I bring up Cook and like all this back uh, this baggage, and especially why I bring up his writing about uh, the Moa Chat and just his writing in general, is not only to point to the fact as Mackenzie has been pointing out that for the lot like this is a great part of travel literature right is the actual writings of the captains and so on and so forth and what their intents were as travelers and what it brought about in terms of knowledge and imperialism but because for the longest time Cook's writing about his experiences here at Nootka Sound would be pretty much the early narratives and the accounts that we would most associate with how life was at the time for the Nuchatnut people who were mm -hmm. the inhabitants of Nootka, right? Sometimes called Moa Chat people. It depends on what period you're talking about, but the the terms sometimes apply to both of those, uh, to both those terms apply to the same peoples. Right. But yeah, for the longest time, Cook's writing and later other writings, which we might get into, namely by a man named John Jewett, the this is pretty much what we had because the rest was just oral traditions that were passed down within the moa chat community and for the public at large cook's account was pretty much the account of the nootka peoples well it's because historians still have a major issue of looking down on oral traditions and are pretty bad at accepting it as fact oh yeah a hundred percent right it's only what when was it in the 70s i think that canada officially recognized oral storytelling and oral traditions as like a valid form of mm -hmm. in, in, historically that's not that long ago by the way like if you look oh, at yeah. it in the grand scheme of things it's really not that long ago and it's not that much of a it, it, it takes a lot of time for people to get used to that fact right? we're still not used to it you know you still have lots of academic spaces where they will disregard oral tradition on the basis that it is that the oral tradition has been shifted, et cetera, et cetera. When like, have they not seen multiple editions of a book? I know they do. I mean, they charge us hundreds of dollars to buy the eighth <laughs> edition of their textbook. So like, they understand that books and written word is edited too. That there's the perception that there's a more a more solid uh, solidity and less malleability. I guess would be a better way to put it yeah. to the written work, right? That any, which we kind of know is false, but whatever. Right. That there's this idea that any uh, change to the written text is intentional, right? Rather than clearly the forgetfulness that you'd get from explaining a story through an oral tradition. Right. I have another point on that one, just in the yeah. fact that I almost think forgetfulness is a bit better rather versus intent to change. Yes is more harmful oh yeah the I biggest example agree. the bible depending on where you got it from your monk in the monastery hundreds of years ago we fought wars over that yeah and yeah. that was intent to change that wasn't forgetfulness even if oral tradition would be warped through forgetfulness and omission that's still a better change i would agree yeah intent to change Mm -hmm. And and also just the way that populations who who do, you know, base themselves off of oral tales, they they integrate that oftentimes into their into their social perceptions, right? And their the the way they live, right? They yep. accept this kind of malleability, and it's it offers a different worldview. Right? It's not considered bad necessarily that things change over time because there's a perception that you know these oral traditions adapt and 
alter according to new situations and new information, new needs, right, for this population, mm-hmm. right? But again, that's like that's the biggest debate around travel literature, and the biggest thing that everybody considers when they read travel literature is how much the narrative is impacted by the writer, the editor, publisher, so on and so forth. I mean, again, going back to John Smith, we take a look at his earlier work compared to his later publishings, and there's a vast difference. Mm -hmm. It's because the publishers and the editors change the story to make it more appealing to sell. Whereas the original text, it was bad. Don't get me wrong. Like it's a horrible misrepresentation, (laughs) but elements in it, like the adventure, the romance with Pocahontas, the fact that all these other things are then amplified by publications and editors, just because they were travel literature was a very popular form of fiction. People wanted to read all these fantastic adventures of far off places. British people were very interested in descriptions of giraffes. It's a real and, text. Yeah. And pineapples, apparently. Like for a while, yeah. it, I think it was, you know, it was just descriptions and pictures of pineapples were very big. Cook himself and his men would write, for example, uh, I'll just quote a bit from the journals just to see like what they say about the Moachat people, right? Do it. So, so for example, this is from a book by Victor Sothrin on Cook, right? Where he describes, based off of his journals, what he thought of the Moa Chats, right? So he says of Cook that the dress and appearance of the Moa Chat startled Cook and his crew at first sight. For mm-hmm. their, quote, and he's quoting Cook here, their faces were bedaubed with red and black paint and grease in no regular manner, but as their fancies led them. Their hair was clotted, and to make themselves either fine or frightful, many put on their hair the down of young birds, or, pla- or, or plaited it in seaweed or thin strips of bark dyed red. The dress of some was loose skin thrown round their shoulders. What do you make of something like this, right? So, for example, if you just take Cook's description of it, right? So he's startled mm-hmm. and he sees these people and he describes them in this kind of way. Right. What do you think his intent, I guess, just based off of this is? He's actually a lot better than other descriptions that I've read. Right. There's a lot, it's a bit more factual from the passage that you've written. It's very, actually very kind of nice how it's, and there's, a, there's an interesting, the most key thing here, and it's going to sound stupid when I say it, it's going to sound strange. Mm-hmm. There's no specification on gender okay. in description. Because how many travel literature people when discussing natives bring up the woman and they, the description leads with the size of their bosom. Yeah. Cook is, again, stand, making himself stand out with how there is, there's just a general population description. I don't know if that was because there was only men when he met them, but there's a, it's definitely an improvement. Well, you're about to be disappointed. Of course I am. <laughs> Um, it's not as bad as you might think, like, um, uh, based off of what you were saying about other travel literatures, definitely. But he does, uh, he does describe uh, the role of women. So yeah, you're right. This is like a general description, apparently based of, off observation, mm-hmm. a, as a lot of these things were just surface level observation without putting too much thought into it, mostly because he couldn't ask them because he didn't speak the language um, of the Moachat people. But he's based off observation here, right? This is very surface level stuff. He's talking about dress. He's talking about uh, hair, hair, you know, the, the, the easy stuff that you can note. Clotted is an interesting word choice. That's, that's definitely one of the first things you can see of his European upbringing where he sees the way they put their hair and he says clotted as oh, yeah. if it is like some sort of dirty bit. I know it's yep. weird to focus on the singular word, but this is just to demonstrate how the perspective matters. Oh yeah, absolutely. Right. It, it puts emphasis on the fact that they're dirty and unkept a bit. But in other parts of his journal, Cook and his crew would emphasize at least the points of similarity with the British, right? Because that's what they knew, obviously. Oh, yeah. The thing is, it doesn't obviously take into account the context in which this is happening or anything surrounding it. The, For example, the reasons, the social reasons things are happening, the way they're observing them, or how that developed in the first place they don't know and so they just simply say uh, they, they simply describe it as it is 
So for example, they mentioned their ability to trade furs, right? Okay, so they have an economy apparently similar to ours in a sense, right? They mm -hmm. understand the question of uh, supply and demand. They mentioned that the Nuchatlut people practiced a form of slavery of both men and women, right? right? But they don't go into many details about who can practice slavery, under what circumstances. <laughs> That's not really explained. Um, and this is where it gets to what you were mentioning. They also mention what free women can do, right? Oh, yay. Because they make a specific point of saying that free women were actually noted to be quite moral, right? They were not interested in providing sexual favors to the men of Cook's crew, okay. and that that was something that they were not used to seeing, right? They had just come from Hawaii and Tahiti and all the, and those su more Southern islands where they had gotten that. So these people seem to be a bit more morally sound, right? More British, say, in nature than, <laughs> than they were used to seeing from native populations. Yeah, because comparison is all that matters, really. Mm -hmm. However, that doesn't stop the slave women from being used for sexual promiscuity. Oh, of course. And here's one quote that another person that was with Cook on his expedition called Samuel, and he quotes uh, his relation with a slave woman. He says that they are taking as much pleasure, that the men, sorry, are taking as much pleasure in cleansing a naked young woman from all impurities in a tub of warm water as a young confessor. It must be confessed, we sometimes found some jewels that rewarded our trouble. Namely, two sparkling black eyes, accompanied with a beautiful face. And when such was our fortune, we never regretted the time and trouble. Okay. I find the language very interesting in this one. I think the use of confessor is very deliberate. Oh, yeah. You know, you're, you're bringing a morality to this. It's like, yes, you're a slave. And at this time, obviously, the British still owned slaves, right? It wasn't something that had been abolished yet. They're at least making some comparisons with a young confessor, right? So the biblical nature of confessing your sins and being aware that it's not great what they're doing, at least in their perspective, mm -hmm. in the British perspective. But, you know, at least we're there to provide the right path, right? The right path to religion right? and morality. But that's what I'm getting, at least, from it. Well, it's also, they, they talk about confessor and then right before they're talking about women, women washing themselves in the tub, mm -hmm. which is always going to be big biblical imagery. Oh, yeah. And also, obviously, there's all the whole thing of, we found some jewels. Um, they, that rewarded they have our trouble. Face. Yeah, they have beautiful faces, black eyes. There's an exoticism to it that mm -hmm. really permeates through this whole passage, which I really enjoy. But I enjoy that it's that that I can observe it, not that he's I follow, I follow. Objectifying women and indigenous peoples. <laughs> <laughs> that just gives us an idea of how they're approaching, right? These people. Again, this is for the longest time what we had as a textual basis and as an understanding of these initial contacts with the Moachat people. Mm -hmm. Apparently, and this we're kind of piecing together from excerpts from the journals. The Moachat people didn't seem particularly awed by the first contact, right? Whereas a lot of the rhetoric that we saw on the East Coast was like, ooh, these people that came in from the sea and we don't really know what they're from, what their deal is, what are these yeah. guns that they're bringing with them? Or at least that's the rhetoric that's presented to us by the textual evidence. We don't know if it's quite true or not. Again, kind of true, kind of false. Right. A little bit of exaggeration to make british power seem all that more powerful absolutely and then a little bit on the west coast you're saying like the spanish had been there before so yeah these white people aren't so surprising i think that has definitely a an element to play with it but also i think i think there were some elements that they saw similarly to the british themselves right, right? there was more of a hierarchy within uh, moachat society than say we'd imagine for East Coast natives, which tended to be a bit more of what we describe today as anarcho-communistic. You know, but there's, so there were some societal relations that were similar in nature, if not similar in practice. So I could see why there would be that perception, at least that 
people were interacting, these two peoples were interacting on a similar ground, right? Or an equal perspective. Mm -hmm. Obviously, going into this, the Moachat people didn't know how much their lives were about to change (laughs) because the Spanish never really came back or came back very rarely. The British were pretty much here to stay. Like, spoiler alert. I think people should try and get read, read a bit more description and decide for yourselves on Cook and his sort of what level of subjectivity and objectivity he held. Because yeah. obviously two passages doesn't cut it. No, but I think it kind of sets it, the idea. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And there's definitely the fact that he is a much more interesting figure to look at. Again, his focus as a cartographer, I think, really plays into that. He's not... He's not looking for the three G's so much as other explorers would have been. Oh, yeah. Totally. He seems like a man who just wants to putz around and draw some maps. Now, the last part I want to mention, right, and I will, we'll kind of go over this very quickly because we've already been talking about this for quite some time. Um, but a couple of decades later, right, so the British had been firmly established by this point as like a really massive empire. A couple of decades later, a man by the name of John Jewett, who was an armorer by trade, would mm-hmm. go by Nootka Sound as well. This is around 1801. So Cook is obviously dead by now. Sorry, 1802. Cook is dead by now. It's been 30, 20 years that he's <laughs> died on Hawaii. Oh, no. But his legacy still remains, right? So basically, in the meantime, between the time John Jewett arrives in Nootka Sound in 1802 and be by a by the time, yeah, that, that whole thing happens that we're going to describe. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, the British had set up basically a really important trading outpost in Nootka Sound. But it also had a time not only to change uh, Moachat society, but the British had time to establish a post and leave that post aside. Right? And we'll see the impact of this through the writings of John Jewett, right? who, upon arriving in Nootka Sound, would actually be captured by them, right? Mm-hmm. There wouldn't be the same relationship or relatively friendly relationship that Cook had gone <laughs> through. Suddenly, he would get there, his boat would be destroyed, everyone on board would be killed except for him and another man. And for two years, Jewett would be kept as a slave by the Moachat people. Now, I mention this because the writing that Jewett would do while he was a slave actually provides even more detail about Moachat society and really goes in depth into, you know, their musical instruments, how the slaves are treated, what the trade that they have with other nations are. Like he really goes Mm -hmm. and tries to explore as much of the society as he can. Now, obviously there is nevertheless a disconnect, namely because of a language barrier and because he doesn't try to really go as much in depth as he maybe could have if you were, say, an anthropologist or a sociologist or something like that. Mm -hmm. But it's still a very interesting uh, text to study. Now, I'm bringing it up because, you know, he talks about dress, housing, hunting. He refers to social conditions. But, you know, he lacks the nuance of fully understanding, once again, the reasons behind certain elements. And, you know, he, he fails to understand that the British basically left the Nootka in a situation of desperation, if you will, where not only did they set them up as an integral trading post, so integrating them into this capitalist system that they were promoting, but then kind of pushed them aside and leaving them to kind of deal with the downfall of that system and being completely on the margins of it, right? And so Jewett is writing about these peoples, but without understanding that they're kind of at a low point because of the destitution that the British had left them in. That's, right. that's what the British do in this time. Yes, just in this time. <laughs> <laughs> now, let's... But, let's... I'm bringing it up just to show the evolution of a narrative surrounding the people of Nootka and surrounding the, 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 the writing of history, right? Oh, for sure. And there's definitely a big part of it, again, plays into that idea, oral history versus written tradition, where the Nootka would have had this whole history that they probably would have said and told, where that shows that they were at the lowest point, but due to the fact that it's not written down and it's disregarded. And then also just to the... Uh, 
the European social Darwinistic idea, you know, mm -hmm. that of course they are destitute and slow low down for they are first nations. It has nothing to do with external factors or other people have left them in the state. Yeah, definitely. Um, I just want to read a section off of Jewett just to give an idea of what he, what he writes like, but again, right. this can all be found for free online on uh, project Gutenberg and it's completely illegal because it's in the public domain at this point. But um, so for example, Druitt writes, the houses at Nutka, as already stated, are about 20 without comprising those inhabited by the Klahars, a small tribe that has been conquered and incorporated into that of Nutka. Though they must be considered as in a state of vassalage, as they are not permitted to have any chiefs among them and live by themselves in a cluster of small houses and at a little distance from the village. The Nutka tribe, which consists of about 500 warriors, is not only more numerous than almost any of the neighboring tribes, but far exceeds them in the strength and martial spirit of its people. And in fact, there are but a few nations within a hundred miles either of the north or south, but are considered as tributary to them. I really, like, this is just one passage, but it's all in this same perspective. Once again, you really see this emphasis of similarities in British society mm -hmm. and Moachat society, right? You're really laying on the aspects without going into too much detail as to why they do this or how. I, it's, there, there's definitely a difference in the viewing and the contrasting comparison, you know? Mm -hmm. Again, going back to Cook a little bit, you can see it in how the, the recognition of the monarch of Hawaii mm -hmm. versus just in the belief of a system of chiefs or similar such practices. Yeah, definitely. Um, but yeah, I recommend reading to it a bit more. We're not going too much into depth with it for time, but definitely read it. It's really an interesting read. There's a bunch of stuff on music, you know, the, their use of uh, bone instruments and uh, dried seal skin for drums and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. But don't expect going into this to get an in-depth analysis of how that society works. You'll get an overview of it. Right. Mm -hmm. an overview of many aspects but an overview nonetheless so we're gonna take a little break and when we come back we're gonna talk about the literature how's that Woo -woo. nice And we're back. Yay. We're going to be talking a bit more about the literature that, we, that I mentioned at the top of the episode, right? So a book of poetry by Lionel Kearns. This is a book I read during a class not too long ago. And one of the, was one of the reasons why I started the show in the first place. Because it's so precisely what we want to talk about, right? What we're trying to do with the show, right? That means, and that is, explain how literature and stories can inform our perceptions of history. As well as create and explore the Canadian canon of that literature. Absolutely, right? So, do you know, have you ever read anything by Lionel Kearns? Uh, no, I only just heard of him when, you, when we brought up that we were doing research. So yeah, the Kearns himself is was actually born in the late 30s in 1937 in bc and he studied at the university of british columbia in the early 60s right and it's there that he met what would become a rather famous literary group known as the tish group right? named after the magazine that he, they had started at ubc and this mm -hmm. is composed of a bunch of famous poets from canada including george bowering frank davy fred waugh who were all very prominent throughout the 70s and 80s. But this is a group, I mention it because this is a group that focused very heavily on remodeling and rethinking the potential of poetry as a form, right? Mm -hmm. Not just as a medium, but what you could do with like the structure of poems and the visuals of poems, much more than just the themes. Kearns would actually publish in the Tisch magazine and would be greatly influenced by their work along with other thinkers like Marshall McLuhan, who was a philosopher who wrote a lot on medium 
right? The medium is the message is a term that comes from him. Ugh. I'm sorry, I'm getting flashbacks to high school. <laughs> like, it's been overused, I agree, but there's no denying that it's a very influential and powerful statement. Oh, for sure. I'm not denying that it is. It's just, it's, I've, been, I've heard about it a lot. Yeah, definitely. But at the time when Kearns was writing, right, it had just come out, right? Marshall McLuhan was writing in the early 60s, mid mm -hmm. uh, mid 60s. This is right around the time that Kearns was getting his start as a writer. And so it would make sense that he's very much into what he's saying. Right. And he's also influenced by what are known as the Russian formalists, who also c were kind of rethinking the structure of text and what form meant as a characteristic of text and storytelling. Mm -hmm. In his own personal world, he would actually play with the format of, po uh, of poetry in what he called stacked verse, which I don't know if you've ever heard of it, but I hadn't until I read about Lionel Kearns. Basically, it means that the stressed syllable in a poem is basically in the middle of, of a stanza. So it's as if throughout the poem, there was a backbone and that's where the stress is. Right? So it creates a, just a different way of reading the poem and a different way of putting an emphasis on certain words. Right, for sure. Which I think is kind of cool. Apparently, he wrote his master's thesis on it. So good on him. Good for him. I, I mentioned this because his fascination with forms of text, so subtext, context, hypertext, as it's later known, and his uh, growing up in fascination with West Coast history, right, as an inhabitant of British Columbia, mm -hmm. uh, came to full fruition with the production and publication of Convergences, which came out in 1982. So... Convergences, it's so hard to describe because I know, I know you haven't read it in its entirety, uh, Mackenzie, <laughs> but just, just in going over it and listeners can see this also just going over it, 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 it doesn't look like a conventional book of poetry at all. Right? I'm sure. I mean, because, yeah, go ahead. I mean, I was looking around it and sort of trying to figure out what it was about and I found a whole essay that somebody had written a long article about metafiction in convergences yep and how he tells you what to read and all this sort of stuff yeah well i mean i guess that's a great segue into what what is exactly <laughs> convergences because in essence what he does is through poetry and through three i guess voices poetic voices he presents both the European version of Cook's arrival in BC, he presents mm -hmm. the Nutka version, and he gives poetry that is his own interjections into both histories. On top of that, you get images that were produced by people on Cook's expedition or that constitute pictures of Nutka artifacts and so on and so forth. Right? So you have this collage of three different voices, five if you include the pictures, right? The the drawings and the photographs like you get mm -hmm. all these different voices that literally converge into this one book and yeah just pr give you this pastiche of literary history or historiographic metafiction as you mentioned just based off of this this, this description right um this very broad overview and we're going to go more deeply <laughs> into it what would you say kearns's intent would be with this Right. Just based off, why would you do something like this? To me, that's commentary. You're doing that to make a statement, to make some commentary, probably from a perspective kind of viewpoint, like you're commenting on perspective because you have, again, the, the Europeans, the First Nations, and the third omniscient. Yes. Who, the omniscient from our time who understands what the implications of such interactions were. Mm -hmm. I think that's got to be one of his major points, you know? Yeah, definitely. By the way, I, I'm asking this almost as a rhetorical question because he doesn't really give an answer. By the way. Which author, what author ever does? <laughs> right. Like, literally on the first page, he start, like, his first interjection is just a series of questions, right? God. So I'll, I'll quote here. This is Kearns, uh, Kearns' own voice within the book, right? So he says, a continuous sense of disorder and confusion descends and threatens my life. My desk is covered with papers that I do not want to see. What will I do with them? What will I do with all this information? 
I want only to do my work, but how am I to begin? How will I deal with the beginning that occurred yesterday and the beginning that I completed two years ago and found again last week? How will I fit all these beginnings together? How am I to accommodate these numberless endings? Right. Uh, he goes on, uh, I'm skipping a few lines here, but he finishes, at this moment, I know only that I'm here and that others have been here before and have left something for me. And as I leave something for you, presumably the reader. Time is a ritual exchange, though the gifts move in a single direction. And that wasn't confusing at all. That all makes perfect sense. I understand. <laughs> so, I found the paper on the desk one is an interesting image to put, especially okay. when he's talking about an explorer. The idea that explorers need to get out there yeah. and want to, well, explore, for lack of a better word. Mm -hmm. So I think his questioning on that sort of, it, it sort of reveals why he's talking about or gives a link between himself and the Europeans and the First Nations versus him just sort of interjecting himself as a all-knowing historian or author or writer looking back through time. Yeah, definitely. It includes his own biases, I guess. Mm -hmm. it, it immediately opens up to this fact that he has flaws as well in what he's trying to say. Right. right, which is an important thing to do. Yeah. The best that I can, the, the best way that I guess I can sum up his intent with this book is less to present uh, a, a correction to the Cook and Jewett narratives, right, that permeated so much uh, of uh, Canada's thoughts about the conquest of British Columbia. Mm. Because, you know, and as I mentioned, right, it's very surface level what Jewett and Cook will present, but it's, in the, for the most part, not entirely factually wrong. It just lacks context, right? Right. Um, it lacks context. It lacks uh, a bit of, a, uh, of an understanding or a deliberate understanding of the population that they're talking about. What I think Kearns is trying to do, at least trying to do more specifically, is to connect lives and moments, right? To kind of present history as a continue as exactly that right this continuous sense of disorder that we perceive in a linear fashion right mm -hmm. that it's never just one narrative right that while the events definitely took place right you can't deny that the event or you can deny but you shouldn't deny that the events took place <laughs> it's the way that they're thought about that is important or the way that they're presented that's important and i think that's the biggest contribution that this book has to offer right yeah is to explore history as a narrative in and of itself in that sort of form it's always going to be something interesting to look at mm -hmm. when people try and take a look at the form itself it always ends up raising a lot of questions of how we digest the form how we read through the form understand it especially from the this interaction that he's considering right now has so many other layers. Again, when we were talking about earlier, the written word versus oral tradition, there's those forms of narrative and history at work. There's the travel fiction narrative mm -hmm. and how his work comes into conflict with that, which is travel literature is the most, again, it's the most narratively driven in that it's a series of events that happen that are described. So what he's positioning himself to do is remarkable. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, by and large, he does a really good job of it. I, 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 there are some issues, I would say, namely the fact this is more of a modern criticism, right? I don't know how much he would have considered it a, very much of a problem. But, like, you know, like it or not, Lionel Kearns is like a white dude talking yeah. about these, uh, these issues, right? In oh, the yeah. 80s, it was less of an issue, but it's still something that could irk some people today looking back. But by and large, I think he really does do a good job of presenting this dialogue of history, right? He's making a dialogue out of what was generally known as a monologue, right? um, which I think is a fantastic way to approach history. I agree with that. I can get behind that. Okay. So, yeah, I, I want to just go through a few pages 
that I thought were really interesting, I guess, or I guess, or if you will have questions concerning the book, because f- for readers, I, uh, I know Mac didn't really have time to, 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 to read it this week. To <laughs> All read the, the book. way through. No, no, but it's, it's fine. Right. So the, we're, we're switching it up a bit. I, I could talk about specific elements for a while, but if you have any questions, just jump in and we'll, we'll mean, go from there. When he's writing this poetry, does he move at all in a sort of historical fashion or is he jumping around a lot? Um, he, okay. <laughs> That's a complicated question. I'm glad it, I asked it. Yes. It's interesting and it allows me to pull from the text also, I guess. So the way that it's written from his perspective, he is not trying, he, he's clearly from his perspective writing from the future looking back, right? Mm-hmm. And he mentions this, right? Uh, he mentions this a few times in the text. I don't remember the page. I'll, I'll maybe find it later. But he, he does allude to the fact that time is kind of a malleable thing, especially as it pertains to this project. <laughs> there okay. is somewhat of a continuous, uh, a continuous timeline that he's going through. So, for example, in the first two pages, he starts off with the contact itself, right? So, there is a beginning, right, that he starts off, Mm -hmm. and it goes a little something like this. He goes, somewhere they arrive. They are visible. They become present to whatever was there. Their talking and groaning and shouting augment the sound echoing and fading in that place. They take up space. They make themselves felt. Interesting. Yeah. Um, so this, for example, in this case, it's not specified, but I think this is, yeah, I, I think this is just an opening of, um, uh, of the, the concept generally, right? It's him mm-hmm. going through the smoke and kind of murkiness of history and arriving at this moment in time, right? So that's what I right. mean when I say time is a bit murky, is a bit skewered here because even in the poetry that's supposedly in the past he's taking a bit of this aspect of arriving there and trying to observe in a kind of uh, objective way right Right. even though it's not entirely possible but right on page two on the second page he he immediately goes in with perceptions of the europeans of the nutka right so Page one is arriving there. Page two will be Europeans looking at the Moachat people. And page three is the Moachat people looking at the Europeans. Right. Right. The poetry kind of reflects that. So there is like a sequence of events that happens. The point obviously is to make it seem that this one single moment takes up three pages worth of material. (laughs) (laughs) But I think that's really interesting, right? Um, because it kind of, it, it, it doesn't, it goes against, I think, a bit the idea of a convergence. It's more of a divergence uh, at, at that point, which I think is... Well, then. Yeah, well, I don't know. That's just my perception. I would literally never thought of that before now. So I'm just throwing that out there. <laughs> but yeah, I think it's saying like, okay, well, from one, this one single moment, these many ideas separate and kind of come back together into this book right that we can experience as a single moment more or less but that had clearly fractured somewhere in 1778 i don't, I don't. does that answer no your no question? i think that's that definitely does that definitely does help um i mean i guess going off of that later on in the book he would clearly write from his present moment right oh. uh, Beyond just his interjections, I mean, he would clearly write. So, for example, he would later talk about, uh, I'll find the page specifically. Yeah. So, he would later talk about the stamps that mm-hmm. would feature some Moachat people. Right. So, he, whoops. So, he would, uh, yeah, he would specifically mention um, that later they, their heritage, I guess, would be to end up on the back of a stamp. Uh, they're, 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 uh, how, how would I say this? The fact that they were so depicted as a still image by the Europeans 
became their life in and of itself later on in the 60s mm-hmm. or whenever that stamp was made right which right. uh cool so so the so yeah future definitely i guess it's his present and the future of the nutka is a simultaneous act okay interesting yeah i guess coming off of that right this idea of time right so right on page three right so time is often related to space right? and how we move through that space according to a specific amount of time right? Mm-hmm. right on page three they kind of address that question immediately um the multiple voices i mean i say they um as if it Cheers. isn't just kerns but uh, yeah Kearns, sorry everyone just i i think they're I think they is a bit more of a pertinent way to approach this because it is multiple voices, theoretically. Well, that's what he's trying to go for anyway. Yeah, absolutely. So it starts off with something like this. So it says, James Cook moves his ships and men through the empty spaces of Europe's mind. Slowly, the delicate lines replace blank areas on the map. The margins of human vision extend outward the world grows rounder and slightly smaller as new information reaches England, spreads to other countries, and is absorbed as knowledge. And just counter to that, right, in Kearns' interjection, we see an image of a stopwatch, right, just below an image of a ship arriving mm-hmm. at Nutka. And Kearns' interjection is this. Distance is duration days, months, years away from home. The gap between the exotic and the familiar, the numbness of the longing. So right off the bat, he describes this idea of, I think what he's trying to go for is that while, (laughs) while advancing this idea of progress, right? Of linear progress, scientific progress, temporal progress, you're also very much solidifying this moment in time, right? This moment Mm -hmm. and this place in a specific period, right? So, you know, we talked about this earlier with map making. Map making is a product of its time. In Mm -hmm. any time, no matter which time you make it in, right? So it's very interesting, I think, that in trying to define something or in trying to encapsulate something, a place, a feeling, a people, you're not allowing them to continue or to evolve, right? Or to progress towards something different, whether it's good or bad. You're freezing them in this moment in time while explicitly relating it to uh, map making and exploration and uh, imperialism in this case. So yeah, I guess this all extends from your your initial question. (laughs) Of when? Of when? When does this take place? So well, I, I think guess it's the answer is all the never, time. never, all the time. Yeah, both. Yeah, and I think that's an interesting point that you have to sort of talk about, just because how important I guess this all is, mm-hmm. if that makes any sort of sense. Sure. Just because of what this entails, you know, especially with what he's trying to do and his use, because he's a historian looking back. Or not a historian, but he's a writer that's looking back while also trying to portray a present time. Yes. So the temporality and the timeline is going to be a big part of it, no matter which way you slice it. Yep, absolutely. Just going off of that, there was a really interesting passage. This is a bit later on page nine. I don't know if you have it open in front of me. I'm saying the pages, I guess, so people can follow along if they want to. But Mm -hmm. um, it, it kind of goes... Uh, a bit off of what we were both saying, right? Where he uh, he mentions, uh, uh, he quotes a David Samwell passage who we quoted before, right? The quote on the uh, slave women. Right? Mm-hmm. Um, he, he, the Samwell quote that he pulls from is every now and then the concert, there was a, uh, there was a spectacle that was put on for the Europeans. Of course. Every, every now and then, the concert would cease, and only an old woman in the same canoe was to be heard, who made a bawling noise very much like some of the cries of London. After jumping for a short time, the performer took his mask off and made just such a noise as the old woman had done. 
Okay. At the same time, holding his arms extended and shaking a small box and a wooden image of a bird filled with pebbles, which made a rattling noise. So contrary to that, Kearns <laughs> will say their cultures as thick as soup, the portable alphabet soup of the English, the indigenous fish and cedar soup of the Moachats. You, say, you claim that the ensuing events will be predictable, but you and I are merely postdicting this situation, an undertaking almost as difficult and equally as inaccurate. Right. So I mentioned this only because we, we've been talking about the, uh, the idea of time and solidifying a culture in a specific moment and place. Do you think it adds accuracy? right, to the historical project that humans have been carrying out for centuries, right? Do you think that it, uh, that it complicates the idea oh. of a Canadian history? Do you think that it is more accu accurate, less accurate, or as you say, that, or as he says, equally as inaccurate as anything else? What do, you, what do you make of this interpretation of history, I guess, as literature? Accurate is a strange one to use okay especially in the fact that he is using it he's using a very artistic representation with poetry mm -hmm. so i think it adds more layers but i wouldn't know i wouldn't claim to understand if it, or i wouldn't claim to say it was being more or less accurate but i think it definitely adds complexity and a certain level a certain level that is lacking in how we understand it you know the relationship of what's going on because uh, understanding and accuracy don't always have to come together yes i think that's a very i think that's a very astute point because he understands the relationship definitely between kearns definitely brings a lot of attention to the relationship between the europeans and uh the nootka peoples and between his observation his point in time looking back right as he's saying he's postdicting a lot of this mm-hmm but as you say, it's not exactly more accurate. He's reframing the narrative, but he's not necessarily adding much. He adds some, but he doesn't necessarily add a lot of information that the that Cook or people like Jewett would later do yeah. to the, the, the Nutka narrative. Like he doesn't really go into much detail about, for example, the cultural importance of whaling that the Moachat had right <laughs> that was a big right. part that was like a big part of their spirituality was whale hunting or it doesn't re he doesn't really explain the cultural significance of these dances that a lot of the europeans mention and mm -hmm. that's not the point so no. i think i think that's a very astute observation that you were mentioning mac that it's more about relating stuff than accurately portraying stuff but i think there's an accuracy nonetheless in the portrayal Right. Oh, for sure. <laughs> in in that sense, I think right? that's fair to say. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There, the the only accuracy is the portrayal. I, I have a bunch of questions, I guess, that I just wrote down, not knowing if you were if you had read it or not. Go ahead. So, let's see. Okay. Let's let's see if I can understand anything. No, but uh, they don't necessarily relate to the text in and of itself. But I, I decided to take like an approach of history as text, right? Or okay. history as narrative. Or how history is represented through text and narrative? Yes. Uh, I think a big part of this book is it kind of lends credence to this idea of history as a process, right? History as something that's con continuously in motion, right? We've alluded to this many times. In a sense, I think he alludes to history as a kind of fiction that, that we all kind of buy into different aspects at different moments in our history, depending on what oh, we want sure. to do with it, right? Again, we have, it's, you have, there's an understanding sometimes that we forget history is crafted. What we understand as knowledge in history is all constructed in a certain way that fits with our beliefs and ideals. There's no one set way to look at history that says this is the absolute history. Mm -hmm. You know, and the, what he's doing is a big part of demonstrating that with his book. And just looking at, again, where oral tradition versus the written word has two very different narrative constructions. Any mythology, they all have different constructions and histories of the world. 
Mm -hmm. So it's hard to say, it's hard to have an definitive way of history, of, especially in a narrative of history. We can list a timeline of events and facts and so on and so on, but that's not a narrative. Yeah. The narratives that we teach are all constructed. So then what's the difference between literature and history, I guess, would be a good question to follow up on that. <laughs> it's like, how would between you... literature and history? Yeah, like between like storytelling and history, right? Is What's the academic difference then if it's a construction? Well, if, if, if you're talking storytelling and history, I don't think the difference is academic. I think the difference is the point. Storytelling involves a message. It involves a message, a belief, or an idea that you're trying to pass down. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you want to look at history in the most purest idea, so the most scientific idea, it would just be, again, a series of facts, events, places, dates, etc. All that boring stuff, you know? <laughs> For example, it's, it was history that four million years ago we had the Australopithecus. Yeah. But the story of the one that we found that is Lucy informs us differently. I think, it's, I think when you're talking about the difference between history and literature, you're not looking so much academic difference as the difference that we are creating. Okay, so it's an intent, it's in perception, I guess? Or yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a way to... Mm -hmm, it's entertainment. Okay. Again, it's the Aristotelian thought process of because we use history to teach ourselves things. But if you're just teaching to teach, it's going to be too boring for anybody to pay attention. So we have to prescribe a narrative to it. Mm -hmm. Which is, again, what history turns into, I think. Or the, okay. history that we, the history that we learn in our schools and that we read about in books. Right. Okay. I, I, can, I can see that. I, I agree to... I agree with the idea, at least, that it's in the approach, it's in the intent. Mm -hmm. um, I'm more willing, I guess, to understand history more as a s storytelling aspect than purely the, than, than simply the yeah, facts, no, I guess. That's fair. It's hard to describe history yeah. because we say, because I do agree history is storytelling. Like part mm -hmm. of history is storytelling. That's going to be so intertwined into it. But then... Yeah the further and further we go back, the less it becomes a history and the more it just becomes a series of events or a chain of, so like what the, I guess my question to you is when does it stop being history? Never. Well, so the big bang is history then, but then if history is sort of tied with storytelling, how does that sort of fit into the idea? You know, we well, have I mean, this whole at that, set. At that point, you're getting into postmodernism, right? You're getting into like, <laughs> all narratives and i guess that's sort of way of relating back to the book right it's just like all narratives are valid at all moments mm -hmm. right that's the history is constituted of the narratives yeah and i think there's they're definitely intertwined but if you're taking a look at again like the academic form of history so where we're trying to use these narratives to figure to learn what was happening in the past versus the history of because there's when you're talking history, there's a bunch of different histories. There's the history of academics. There's a family history. There's yeah. cultural history. There's the history of a location. Mm -hmm. All of these chains that we carry with us that sort of link us back. So I think like the differences of history get muddled at different points. Like family history and storytelling are essentially the same thing. Okay. In my yeah. view, you know, they're both very focused on specific narrative telling a specific story. Whereas, you know, going back to, say, scientific history, well, like what, say, a geologist does with carbon dating and all those in the study of rocks and such, this, the narrative is, it's still there, but it's a bit more removed from the right. situation. Right. But going off of that, I guess, and exploring a bit what Kearns is doing with convergences is... I guess, do, does history happen at the moment of its telling, right? Or, do, or does the importance of history happen at the moment of its telling? Or is it simply always there and we have to discover it in whatever way? I guess coming back to the idea of discovery also, right? Do, mm -hmm. well, at I what had, point do we become aware of history? I had an elementary school teacher. Mm -hmm. And she was our history teacher. And she said a very interesting thing that's always stuck with me and okay. how I sort of view history. Yeah. 
And that was, she's standing there and she says, okay, you guys, uh, you guys came and you sat down. That was five seconds ago. That's history. Okay. And then she says, every time you move forward, the stuff behind you, that becomes history. It just becomes, now it's just becoming a fact of you decide what the history you want to talk about is, what's important history. Okay. You sitting there in silence for three seconds, it's history, but nobody's going to talk about it. Yeah. So there is an element of awareness, right? Yeah. The history that you're. Yeah. It's history is constantly being crafted, but it only gains significance on the awareness of that history. Yeah. Okay. That so like me, way, yeah. me okay. eating breakfast this morning, that's part of history, but that's <laughs> never, but it's never going to be something that people decide to be aware of. I know nobody's going to want to know what kind of cereal you ate. I don't eat cereal. What cereal kind of, has, what kind cereal of cereal has carbs? Gosh. What kind of barbarian are you? <laughs> I have smoothies. I'm a university student. That's the kind of barbarian that I am. <laughs> yeah. Okay. That's fair. But yeah, no, I, I guess. If, I guess coming back to the, the question that you posed at the beginning, what you were saying, right, about the awareness of history as a continuity, as picking and choosing, I guess that's the intent more than anything else of Lionel mm -hmm. Kearns's book, right, is to bring that idea to the forefront, right? You're informing, you're entertaining, but you're also making people intrinsically aware of the position they're in. Right? Mm -hmm. Historically, as people, as people interacting with history and other peoples throughout past and present and potentially future. Right? But I think, I, I think I'm going to go back on what I said at first. And <laughs> re although that both might be right, like, I think it's more accurate to say that Kearns' intent is to promote an awareness of history. Right? Yeah, I think that's fair. All right. One last thing that I want to mention. Uh, or at least last, depending on if you want to, <laughs> if you have other questions or whatever. Let's hear it. But I want to bring attention to the images that Kearns includes in his book. Okay. Right. So a lot of them were produced by a man named John Weber. Right? Now, John Weber was with uh, James Cook on the ship, and he drew a lot of the images of the Nootka people. So the ultimate depiction of surface level. There's, it's depictions of dancing, it's depiction of peoples, it's depiction of slaves, mm -hmm. any aspect that he can visually see, right? And that leads to a lot of interpretation, right? It's a snapshot, it's a moment in time. But I want to bring specific attention to what images or the idea of an image, right? The idea of a snapshot has on perceptions of history, not only in the sense of a generalization, right? Because Yes, of course, if you, if you base your understanding of an entire population or an entire moment off of a painting, right, it can offer yeah. completely different interpretations, right? Even right. one similar painting it can give two people a different interpretation of what happened. Really? Damn. Yeah, obviously. But like, or two different pictures of a same event. So you, you get what I mean, right? It can lead yeah, to generalizations. No, no. However, I, I think there's something to say also about what Weber chooses to put into the images, right? <laughs> um, and I'm specifically talking about uh, two images or one image on each page, on pages 24 and 25 of the book, where on 24, you see what was known as a man of Nutka. So you see with long hair, tattoos on his forehead, a nose ring. And Ugh. on page 25... You see a supposed woman of Nutka with a cone-shaped hat with some fish on it. She's a cone head? <laughs> don't harken back to that horrible movie. Please don't. It was great. I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> the, the point is, this is wrong, but it's deliberately so. Because women of Nutka did not wear those hats. They're known now, anthropologically speaking, and you know, through oral traditions that we mentioned and that Kearns had access to through recordings. The women of Nutka did not wear hats, but not those ones that, are, that John Weber depicts them as. Those hats were specifically meant for noble hunters, right? Hence the fish, right? And the whales that are on it. The point is he changed it. He changed the, the hat from the man to the woman because he wanted to depict the tattoos on the man's head. So he changed right. this culture, just what seems initially slightly, right? A, a 
difference that most people would, well, that nobody would have known unless you, you knew the history and culture of the Moachet people. But he changes it in order to show theoretically like a wider scope of cultural elements, I guess. Right. Kearns makes another interjection after these two images. Right? And I think this really hits, hits home a point that we've been trying to make, or even though we haven't specifically alluded, it, uh, alluded to it throughout. Right? So he says, notice the woven images of the whales and the harpooners' canoes. It is a nobleman's hat, right? So Weber has made the change for us so that we may be able to view both the hat and the tattoo design on the man's forehead. Such textual liberties are well-intentioned and designed for your edification, even when they are taken by me. So I think this is an interesting point that Kearns makes, especially the point that such liberties are well-intentioned and designed for your edification, even when they are made by me. Well, obviously, we don't know what Weber's intentions were per se. We were never in his mind. But, you know, as, as Kearns points out, his point is to show two different aspects, right? That he couldn't exactly show if he kept the hat on the nobleman's head, right? He couldn't have showed the tattoos. Right. But the idea of history designed for edification and for the reader's edification specifically. So I guess my question is, how much either of history or literature, I guess, as an extension, how much does the reader or consumer have to say in how history is determined? So um, I think that's a large part. Again, if we're talking about history as storytelling and narrative, yeah. then the reader well, makes the biggest decision in the end. Mm -hmm. And then you can, historians and those who talk about and write about history can try and guide us down a certain path for so long. But in the end, the audience decides. Do the audience decides what they like, what they don't like, what's important to them and what isn't important to them, and then therefore that decides what becomes history and what isn't. So I guess we make our own headcanons of history? We, you in a way... You choose facts? Uh, well, because, again, not the I'm individual. here, obviously, but... Like, yeah. It's not the individual, though. Mm -hmm. It's the audience it is the general population at large because right. there are people that very obviously disregard facts yes deniers and conspiracy theorists abound yeah but they are often shifted to the side of society flat earthers they were yep. they reject the very common fact that the earth is in fact round and despite all the other beliefs that we hold but to them that is their rejection of history there's a now famous historian called Hayden White, who in the 70s the wrote a book called uh, Metafiction. Uh, no, oh, sorry, yeah. Metahistory. I love the word. Oh, meta. <laughs> what a fun word. Yeah, but the whole point of that book was this idea that a lot of history, he's saying he was specifically focusing on 19th century European historians. He was, his whole point of the book was saying a lot of this history was constructed with a nationalist view in mind. Right? Oh, yeah. 19th century Europe was a place where ideas of nation and nation state specifically were being remodeled and solidified, right? Solidified through these histories, by the way, like the borders that we mentioned and the map making extends to text, by the way. Like I, I, there's an argument to be made that text is a border in and of itself. But he, his whole point was like, you know, not that the history is wrong. What they're pointing to is like this, these events happened, but it's all about the way in which you present it and the way in which you model it and which elements you choose to highlight in which sequence that completely change your, the readers and the audiences rapport to history, right? Oh yeah. And it I creates mean, these nationalist narratives. Right? Bringing this back to Canada. Yeah. If you look at most, if you look at Canadian textbooks that talk about Quebec history, specifically Quebec textbooks and their discussion of the referendums, it's very, in a Quebec-centric narrative, it's very focused as this triumph of the Quebec people, yeah. of them sort of looking for their, like, standing up for their province and then standing up for their culture when they say, we want to be recognized as, uh, what was it, independent culture in Canada? I'm not going to place judgment value on that mm -hmm. statement because you never see in the textbooks what was happened. I think it was it was in an Alberta assembly where a First Nations man stood up and said, okay, if we're recognizing independent cultures, where's my recognition? Oh, yeah. So the presentation, and the most important part is the omittance. What is not told is often much more important than what is told. 
Yes. And it creates these myths around things that happened relatively not too long ago in the realms of history. Things like Canada's victory in the War of 1812, which is not what, <laughs> it's not what we say it is. We did not whoop the Americans, as we so like to say. Yeah, exactly. It's, it's very, yeah, that's a whole thing. <laughs> like it's mostly the British still there, but it wasn't yeah. like this grand battle, but it creates a romance, right? It's a romantic idea of history. Right? Yep. Now, that's, that's not to say, by the way, I, 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 and I'm specifying this because Hayden White himself got into a lot of hot water with, that's not to say that there are no facts. Right? Oh, no. Exactly. Again, the idea is like how you, how you explain those facts, how you present them. Right, because and uh, how those facts are accepted or rejected. Exactly. I again, guess some people deny the fact that the Earth is round. Yeah, but uh, again, like his White's work was taken up by like neo Nazis and Holocaust deniers and stuff like that. Like, of course, he was not one. By the way, like he 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 completely rejects those those ideas. J just to say, no, like, he was trying to make a point, and then his work, in the was, same way that like Marx led to what happened in Russia. Yeah, um, I think. We can start winding down just because I think we can. <laughs> like what, hour talking. and a half. Um, I guess just as a last question, right? Just to kind of cap this all off. So we've officially like started exploring the other side of the continent, right? We've mostly focused for the past twenty-five episodes on the East Coast. Do you see? And kind of coming back to these uh, to the question initially posed by Via that I opened the episode with. Do you see already a difference between how the British interacted with the Nootka or came into contact with the, sorry, the Moa Chat people and how the French and British kind of interacted on the East Coast? Like how, do, do you already see differences between Eastern oh, yeah. settlement and Western settlement? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. There's more of a dialogue going on. And I think that's just a matter of geographical location. Okay. On the Eastern side, it was easier. It was, I get easier is relative term. Mm -hmm. But it was less time for them to get there so they could be afford to set up a base, do a bit more conquering, you know? Yeah. The usual European tactics. Whereas to get all the way to the western side, they didn't have a reliable land route just yet. So they had to go either past the tip of Africa or down the coast of South America. So there's definitely this idea of they needed allies. They needed to make trading partners so they had to be a bit friendlier to an extent yeah yeah to an extent obviously yeah. <laughs> like, when you're talking when you're talking friendly relations with first nations people it's all relative <laughs> oh yeah big time i'm um, talking like 20 out of 100 instead of 10 you know <laughs> it's again relative i think that's uh, i'll agree with that with this idea I, I didn't think of it in the sense of distance but that's definitely an excellent point also this comes back to to what i was saying to, to what I mentioned at first, is that this initial contact with the Moachat people, and then the British will kind of move on after the, the Moachat are no longer necessary, like, or the people of Nootka Sound are no longer central, I guess, mm -hmm. to, to their endeavors, right? Economic, scientific, and otherwise. Conquering. Conquest. <laughs> and, whereas, Thought you know, on the, east, on the East Coast, they'll just, they'll, 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 you, they'll, they'll just conquer in through and slaughter them out. or push them towards the middle of Canada, right? Put them on reserves. Constrain them into like tiny that. reserves. Right. Whereas, by and large, the, first of all, there are very few or l l no treaties, depending on where you are in BC. Like, it's not at all the same type of relation. Uh, we'll get to that eventually, but already, as you say, there's, they're, they're kind of starting off on a different foot. Where, yes, there's contact, and yes, the elements of contact are similar, but the aftermath of that contact is already different, right? Even though, theoretically, it's a similar type of population, right? Europeans interacting with, or French and English Europeans interacting with native populations, it's already setting the basis for differences between the East Coast and the West Coast. Well, it's also, it's a temporal thing. Like the British got around to them a lot later than they did their settlements in mm -hmm. New England and New France. They're yeah. coming out, they're coming to the game a lot later. So the romanticism has died down a bit. Yeah. The romanticism of the age of exploration. So when they get there, it's less, we must spread glory, God, and blah, blah, blah. It's more, okay, what, what, how can we do this as efficiently and as fast as possible to get everything we need? 
And it's also the fact the British didn't have the same holdings that they did. They still had the, the other countries of Quebec and all that, but they had just lost their big ticket item, oh, New yeah. England. So their focus was more shifting to India and the region around there. Oh, yeah. Now, I think I know I, this, this question is going to be a bit, I think, easier. I think I, at least I know how you're going to answer. I think one of the major elements of Kearns's book is how it complicates the idea of a nation, kind of brings the idea of a construction that's less stable and more malleable than anything else. I think what Kearns is doing, he's just revealing yes. a truth of the fact, which is, and it's gonna, I'm going to sound so conspiracy theorist or sketchy when I say this, <laughs> but a lot of what we have built as our society and as a nation is fabricated. It's myth. I don't want to, I don't want to say in solution, but it's only there because we give it the sort of mental thought and acuity that creates nationhood. Yeah. We create this idea that we have some sort of relation with the people of our country when that's not entirely true. I have no relation to the people. I have more friends in the States on the island of Bermuda than I do in British Columbia. Right. That's, I probably, I know more. Thinking, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I know more people that live in Arizona than I do none of it. Yeah. And I, I see what you mean. So I don't think Kearns is complicating the idea. I think he's just revealing what the idea truly is. It's like there's an episode of The Simpsons where Homer is standing on a border of some kind. And I think it's, it's either at an embassy or to the U.S.-Canada border. And he's hopping from one side to the other, <laughs> going back and forth. And he's going... U.S., Canada, U.S., Canada, U.S., Canada, just because the lines are imaginary, folks. Yeah. I'm sorry to say, we're the only people that do that. We're the only species that does this. Yeah, really. <laughs> like other animals obviously mark their territories and live in these packs, but we're the only ones that push this, like this belief exists because we have this faith in the idea of a nation. Mm -hmm. It's, yeah, exactly. It's nationalism. It's its um, own form of religion. Totally. Absolutely. <laughs> it's, it's something mythical and untangi intangible that you believe in. Yeah, definitely. Is there anything else that you wanted to add or kind of cap off with? Or are you good? God, this is a long episode. We've been at this one for a <laughs> while. I think there's a lot to talk about. There is. And I, I like the discussion that we had. It's definitely, it's definitely going to blow open moving forward especially because we're moving through the 1800s now and we're about to hit the big one mm -hmm. oh the, yeah the, the singularity of canadian history i guess and i i want to mention this i maybe should have mentioned this at the start of the episode right this was less of an episode about uh, about what the moachat culture was and what British culture was at this point. The, we don't have the basis of knowledge to talk about the cultures of First Nations peoples or tribes. I mean, we, we have as much as like, in so far as like we base ourselves off of the stories and works mm -hmm. that other people have, have provided, right? But I don't think that was the point of this episode, really. No. The point was to demonstrate the interactions, right? Or the constructions of history more than anything else. And I think we succeeded in that. If there's nothing else, as always, thank you everyone for listening. You Thank can you. reach out with any questions, comments, or concerns on the Facebook page, on Twitter, and, of course, by email. You can always support the show through PayPal as a kind of pay what you feel the show is worth. I'll give you a tree fitty. Hey, it's something. It allows me to buy a coffee. <laughs> <laughs> and you can always check out the recommended reading page that I set up. You can buy through the affiliate links that are there. As always, you can check out the Patreon for extra episodes and ad-free episodes. So that's always worth it. Uh, consider subscribing to that. Mackenzie, is there anything else that you wanted to add? Nationhood is a lie. Facts <laughs> are relative. And the government is against you. Oh, wow. Going out on a strong note. Okay. Thank you, everyone, for listening. We'll see you next time. Ooh, wait, I forgot something. Don't forget to leave a review on iTunes. It helps boost the show. All right. <laughs> Cheers, everyone. <laughs>